After the excitement over the Ukrainian raid into Kursk region died down, Russia's main offensive on the front began to dominate again. Ukrainian troops are retreating under pressure from the slow advance of the Russian army in the Donbass, where it has a significant advantage in numbers and firepower. According to The Economist, citing Ukrainian sources, Ukrainian forces have withdrawn from Volodar and fighting is continuing in the Toretsk sector, but as of today, no significant advances have been recorded there. However, Russia has yet to capture important towns such as Chasovyar and Pokrovsk. The latter remains a key logistical hub for Ukraine, but Russian troops are stuck fighting for it. Throughout August, there was much discussion of a possible rapid fall of Pokrovsk, but the Russian advance has slowed and there have been no significant territorial gains in the last three weeks. According to Nico Lang, a former German defense official, Russia does not have the strength to launch a full-scale offensive on Pokrovsk, despite the proximity of artillery to the city. Taking Pokrovsk would allow Russia to continue its offensive into central Ukraine and worsen logistics in the southern Donbass. However, even if successful, the operation could last for months and inflict heavy losses on Russian troops. Despite fears of a possible collapse of Ukrainian defenses, Kyiv continues its strategy of gradually surrendering territory while inflicting maximum losses on the enemy. Russian losses, especially in men and equipment, are growing to a thousand soldiers a day and Soviet armored stocks may run out as early as next year. The Institute for the Study of War reports that Russia lost at least five armored divisions in the battle for Pokrovsk, significantly weakening its position. Russia's artillery superiority is also declining, although it is increasingly dependent on unreliable ammunition from North Korea. If at the beginning of the year the ratio of artillery shelling was 10 to 1 in Russia's favor, now this gap has narrowed to 2.5 to 1. This was made possible by an increase in the supply of shells from allies and Ukraine's own production, as well as successful strikes on Russian ammunition depots. However, the publication notes that the Russian Federation has not achieved the main goal of the offensive. Despite the current gloom about Ukraine's prospects, Russia is far from achieving its main goal of taking control of the Donetsk and Luhansk regions by the end of this year. And while Russia has set a goal of dislodging Ukrainian forces from the Kursk region by the beginning of this month, it now looks like it will take much longer and require significantly more force. Florida residents returned to the familiar ritual of assessing hurricane damage Thursday, the day after Milton smashed through many coastal communities and spawned a barrage of tornadoes that killed at least five people less than two weeks after the misery wrought by Helene. The storm knocked out power to more than three million customers, flooded barrier islands, tore the roof off a baseball stadium and toppled a construction crane. But many people also expressed relief that Milton wasn't worse. The system spared Tampa a direct hit, and the lethal storm surge that scientists feared never materialized. The system tracked to the south in the final hours and made landfall late Wednesday as a Category 3 storm in Siesta Key, about 70 miles south of Tampa. Damage was widespread, and water levels may continue to rise for days, but Governor Ron DeSantis said it was not the worst-case scenario. The worst storm surge appeared to be in Sarasota County, where it was 8 to 10 feet lower than in the worst place during Helene. The storm also dumped up to 18 inches of rain in some areas, the governor said. Just inland from Tampa, the flooding in Plant City was absolutely staggering, according to city manager Bill McDaniel. Emergency crews rescued 35 people overnight, said McDaniel who estimated the city received 13.5 inches of rain.